Um, thanks for that, Annie, uh, and welcome everyone, um, all of those who are joining us this morning on site, and, and uh, obviously to those tuning in um, online. It, it could be any time of day or night, but thanks for, for uh, 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 being part of this. Uh, my name is Nathan O'Donnell. I'm a research associate at IMA in relation to the, the three-year um, project on self-determination that, that Annie has, has mentioned. Um, this, is, this, this is a really expansive project. Um, it has involved a whole range of, of programming around engagement and exhibitions um, uh, and uh, research, um, including the, the International Summer School that happened earlier this year on the subject, and this very important four-day conference we're, we're, we're hosting, um, and next year a, a major exhibition exploring self-determination from a global perspective. Um, and part of what we're doing, as Annie's mentioned, is, is looking at Ireland uh, in, in, in context of these other states that formed in the 1910s and 20s, and the kinds of shared processes and methodologies that emerged across these new national contexts, uh, both on the part of artists and the state. So, it's been, I mean, it's been a real privilege to be able to spend these, these three years, that for Emma to be able to spend these three years exploring a subject in this way, I, I think it's really incredible. And it allows for a, a, a certain kind of uh, expansiveness in terms of research, a capacity to zoom in with a close historical lens, but then also to zoom out and consider broader resonances of this idea of self-determination in the contemporary world. Um, it's also been a vehicle for uh, ongoing conversations and exchanges, and I think that aspect of the project is nicely illustrated by our, our keynote speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Jessica Zikovic, who we are so glad to welcome to Dublin to speak about self-determination in Ukraine today. Um, Jessica was a contributor to the summer school back in July uh, and spoke so eloquently about the, the, the sort of charged nature of the public realm in, U in Ukraine and the ways in which artists have engaged with it and used it. Um, it's a subject she's also explored in her brilliant book, Superfluous Women, Art, Feminism and Revolution in 21st Century Ukraine. Um, and that's published by the University of Toronto Press. Um, and she's also since come on board to advise us about Ukrainian works and Ukrainian collections uh, as we go through the process of preparing for that exhibition I mentioned next year. So again, this, this is just to demonstrate the ways in which uh, conversations have been able to unfold and uh, expand across these different contexts. Uh, when Jessica and I first spoke earlier this year, she, she told me about her own connections to Ireland um, and her wish to, to visit Dublin again. I know, I know you were here some, some years ago in, in the early 2000s. Um, so we're really pleased to have her with us in person today um, and grateful to her for speaking to us about self-determination uh, in Ukraine against a backdrop, as we all know, of such uncertainty and turmoil. Um, this is a situation in which the question of self-determination has become startlingly to the fore uh, in recent months, uh, in real human terms, um, over almost, almost nine months now um, since the, the resurgence of, of hostilities, since the, the, uh, uh, um, the well, it, we could say the invasion of Ukraine, except that that war has actually been ongoing for, for, for several years before. Um, uh, it's also important, I think, that we continue to speak about the war and that we don't allow the, the mechanics of the news cycle to normalise it or, or insulate us from it. So, so we're really thankful to you, Jessica, for agreeing to speak. Just to give a little more biographical background, uh, Jessica is director of the Fulbright Programme in Ukraine and IIE, Institute of in in International Education, the, the Kiev office. Um, she recently published the, her monograph that I've mentioned, Superfluous Women, in, in 2020. Um, and the book's been reviewed in multiple languages and countries. It, it won the honourable mention for the Omelian Pritzek Prize for Ukrainian Studies at ASEES uh, and the MLA honourable mention for the Scaglioni Prize in Slavic Studies. Um, the book will soon be published in Poland by the Museum Sztuki Nowoszenski in Warsaw um, in, par in partnership with Character Press Krakow uh, and in Ukraine by uh, Kritika Press. Um, Dr. Zikovic has also had many significant fellowships and scholarships and is a board member of the Association for Women in Slavic Studies, um, an advisory board member of HNET Ukraine, and co-editor of the Forum for Race and Postcolonialism. So I'll, I'll hand over to Jessica now. Jessica will speak for maybe 40 to 45 minutes, uh, and we'll have time for, for a few questions at the end then. Um, so all that remains is for me to ask you to please join me in, in welcoming Jessica. Thank you for that warm introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining today. Um, it is really an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, 
I have a PowerPoint, and you can see my title is a little more descriptive here. It is from the woman question to the Ukraine question, a view of revolution and war in the 21st century. And of course, they use the woman question and the Ukraine question a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, and I know after uh, this presentation, there will be a discussion of Algeria as well. And the Algerian question was one of the reasons James Baldwin said when he was in Paris that he would return back to America to visit and to be a part of the revolution, um, the beginnings of the civil rights movement that were taking place in the US. If we can go to the next slide, that would be great. Right. Oh, great. Okay. Well, before we go to that one, this is the cover of my book, which also uses a tongue-in-cheek title, Superfluous Women, which I explain a bit more in the introduction of my book in reference to the superfluous man, which was a literary archetype from the late 19th century. Um, but largely, this is in reference to women activists, feminists, in the years between Ukraine's two recent revolutions, the Orange Revolution of 2004 and Maidan Revolution of Dignity 2013-2014, who large, by and large were viewed as irrelevant to society with the demands they were making. Um, and then now still oftentimes encounter um, ideas that feminism or women's rights are not important during a time of war, that these are secondary to society or even decorative. Uh, this book traces a generation um, at the time that I was very much engaged with as a participant observer, regularly uh, living, traveling, working in Ukraine, also in Poland nearby, and trying my best to witness and document um, the struggles for emancipation among women. Um, what is important and what more of my focus today will be on is the hindsight that, that has been gained now in the 21st century, looking back on the 20th century, and the connections that activists today, women are making to the time of the 20s and to World War I in Kyiv, but also globally. So um, Nathan had mentioned my connection um, to Ireland and my connection, I suppose, is a transatlantic one and an identification with the early women's movements that I have spent uh, over half my life um, researching and <laughs> investigating. My gra grandmothers and great-grandmothers were from Ireland and Poland and Ukraine and went to New York and worked in the textiles, in the textile industries in the Lower East Side. Um, today, one might call them sweatshops. <laughs> and child labor was also a major issue at that moment. There was no labor code in the United States. Um, there was a, a very big fire <clears throat> that took place in the shir shirtwaist factory, Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, in what is now the Soho District of New York. And the women factory workers there um, joined together in protest and also started to communicate with major figures of suffragism in Germany and in former um, Tsarist lands uh, that were then going through the Bolshevik Revolution because women, women in America had not gained the right to vote and also they, they were being um, subjected to, to very dangerous labor conditions. This was the beginning of the suffragist movement. Figures today, like Rosa Luxemburg, Clara Zetkin, stand for a kind of um, you know, far left almost, or uh, socialist, and they were socialist, but uh, a kind of radicalization of the women's movement that has rendered it maybe irrelevant by a more mainstream discourse of women's rights. And what I would like to do today is show you in Ukraine um, what artists in particular and institution makers in the creative professions and also in university professions are adopting and reimagining um, from that moment of the 20s for today, for, 
for nation building in a country that is at war, but is also very much at revolution, that the revolutionary processes taking place in Ukraine today are still taking place amid the war. The Maidan revolution in 2013-2014 was not only about growing closer to the EU accession agreement and the benefits that go with entering into more global trade routes and um, also introducing things like a civic code and a, a labor code in Ukraine. But this is also largely about um, civil rights and the revolution among this generation for more free, um, less regulated spaces of discussion. So censorship and freedom of expression among artists and among women's rights movements and activists go hand in hand. And for art, oftentimes, just like feminism, um, in a time of war, it's very hard to make these arguments as to why this is important now. It is always important, and history shows us that. So I want to share a few images um, with you this image is from Vinitsets by uh, photographer Brendan Hoffman, um, who is American. He's a war photographer. I'm sharing this with you and also this by Oksana Parafinyuk, also a photographer, Ukrainian, to give you a sense of my context in what um, I spend most of my time doing these days, which is gathering humanitarian supplies for people whose lives are under threat. Um, social organizing, utilizing the skills that I have gained through many years of discussion with women's rights activists. These are skills that are widely applicable and very important in a time of war. Um, and by sharing these skills, training others, and implementing them, I do believe that, that we are saving lives. Um, I want to, again, uh, return to the 20s and 30s. So in 1930, um, one of Ukraine's best known women painters from this era, Oksana Pavlenko, created this painting, Long Live March 8. March 8, International Women's Day, um, was a very important um, community building kind of time frame that the early suffragists were, were a part of internationally in creating the first Women's Congress in Germany that led to that country gaining uh, women's rights to vote, one of the first countries to do so. Um, the women living on the territories of modern-day Ukraine were part of the Bolshevik Revolution at, at this moment. Um, the women's rights, was, rights movement was largely enfolded into the Bolshevik Revolution, and painters, artists who identified as Ukrainian within the Bolshevik struggle were still able to express their national sentiment um, up until the 30s. In the 30s, when Stalin came to power, um, there was a very violent oppression of any expression of nationalism among all of the republics of the Soviet Union. And the ideas here um, nationalism meaning something very different than it does in, in the modern day context of discussions of nationalism at that time. Nationalism in the Soviet discourse was any expression of ethnic culture because in the Soviet rhetoric, ethnicity and, and nation were the same thing. There was no uh, kind of contemporary understanding of a civic discourse or vocabulary of a nation as a sovereign state. And Many artists using folk motifs like Oksana Pavlenko, because in many of her paintings and many of her depictions of, of everyday um, life in Ukraine, she was using folk motifs. She, she was murdered by Stalin um, and all of the, the artists and poets in this particular period of the early 1930s who perished are now understood and referenced in Ukraine as the executed Renaissance. Today, there is a lot of 
um, effort to bring to light the documents around their trials and persecutions in order to show war crimes and targeting of ethnicity by the uh, Putin dogma today. So there is a parallel that is drawn oftentimes in, in art and museum communities in Ukraine that um, has relevance and value in a time of war uh, because historically we can show on the record the um, targeting of culture and the targeting of ethnicity and the targeting of one's self-identity or self-determination as a crime, a crime categorized by Stalin, a crime categorized by Putin, who references in his speeches um, Stalin as a hero. It goes to show and, and argues even farther um, that today's war is unfolding on the same surfaces of execution and genocide as Ukrainians have experienced before in the 30s. I should mention today or in a week, we will have in Kyiv a symposium about Holodomor in 1932 to 33, just after this moment, um, Stalin collectivized the grain throughout the territories of Ukraine, resulting in um, 7 million deaths of Ukrainians. Um, this is a recognized genocide in many countries, although some countries have only signed on in the last year. Um, in, in Russia, of course, the Holodomor is not recognized as genocide, but it, it was a moment um, and still is a moment that, uh, I, that creates a, a national identity in Ukraine uh, because the state has built a history and a consensus around history with the help not only of, of officers, as it was in the Soviet Union, but the help also of civilians and artists who depict those crimes and who bring them into view. And what I also will mention um, in those efforts that has been ongoing recently in Ukraine is depictions of censored uh, paintings. These paintings like this one, this is another painting by Oksana Pavlenko, were never shown in their time uh, because they were deemed um, they were deemed to be subversive and and not compliant with cultural policy under the Soviets, under Stalinism, and they have been kept uh, thousands of paintings like this in spetsfonds, special depositories in museums that were sealed um, during the Soviet era and never opened after the revolution. In 2013-2014, these, these spets fonts became available for the first time to public researchers. You, anyone can go to Ukraine um, and with some assistance and uh, documentation, you can access these fonts and view the censored paintings. Some of them have been put um, on display in curated exhibitions to educate audiences about the destruction of culture as a destruction of people in the 30s. And there's not always a clear mark as to why the painting was censored. And there's a very interesting um, sort of community of research growing around a, a forensics of censorship, and not only in paintings, but also in text and in the historical archives of the secret Soviet police, the NKVD, from this period especially. Um, anyone, actually, the, one of the best organized, now digitized archives in Ukraine is the secret police archive because the Ukrainian state um, has made it a priority since the revolution to encourage international researchers to come to look at the archive to see the evidence of the types of war crimes and genocide that were committed in the past against Ukrainians. I think those archives now are even more relevant and even more important. And artists were listed among one of the main populations for destruction, along with teachers, along with officers. Anyone who was working with information essentially could be ideologically suspect by the regime in power. So let us go back again 
to the women's movement. If the women's movement was enfolded into the Bolshevik one and the Soviet um, policies later developed around women and women's rights, um, meaning women had the right to vote, um, wouldn't we think it was more liberal and open than the US, where women did not gain the right to vote until 1920, later, three years later than in, in Ukraine? Um, well, not necessarily because, of course, just like today, uh, the woman question and the Ukraine question also are tools of ideology in different myth-making and imaginaries around who the people are. Are people self-determining, we the people, or are people determined by their governments? These are really, I think, um, the, the seeds of, of revolution as an ongoing um, embodied practice not one that ends. For a revolution to be effective, it has to never end. Uh, the Soviets had, obviously, the eternal revolution written in stone um, and codified, but the women's rights movement, I think, and developing a civic language early on at this time, we might even look at it as a prototypic language for today, can be useful for understanding where revolutions as soon as they become official by the state, can overdetermine, overdetermine identity. That still there has to be space for women and, and artists to push back against where they feel they have been overdetermined or censored or not able to fully um, embody their experience. And in, in looking back at this moment, right now in Ukraine, it's been very important, and there has been organizing around this in Russia too, recently among women. There was an article um, published in Le Monde just uh, last week about it, but there are active references to the anti-war movement that began in 1915. This was international. And it um, began with the establishment of the International Committee uh, for women's suffragism, and this was entered into the Women's Committee at The Hague, and only a few years later, so that was 1915, in 1919, there was establishment of the International Congress uh, for Permanent Peace and Freedom at the UN, and this Congress still exists today. It was created in 1990, at the end of World War One, and should be renewed as also having its roots in the women's movement. It's important to think about the last five years and 20 years in the buildup to the all-out invasion of the war in Ukraine. There have been um, ongoing battles in Lysychansk, in Donetsk in um, all of Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast and Crimea has been occupied since 2014. The war has been ongoing and the you know, response to that in Ukraine and the rest of Ukraine has been um, to try as much as possible to get the West's attention to look at what is going on. And it's important to, to also know that parallel to the war happening since 2014, the revolution has been happening. In Kyiv, I've been going to the uh, pride marches and the women's marches since 2012. And this photo, I think, captures very well um, the, the role of information and disinformation around these marches. You can see a drone um, carrying the, the rainbow flag over the other side of the barricades where the opposition to the march was standing. And it was very clear that if those barricades were not 10 feet high fences, there could be serious um, instances of violence happening here. And there have been in the earlier years of the march, but now the police, the city police, partake in protecting the march largely um, encouraged to do so by the fact many 
foreign dignitaries from foreign embassies have joined the protesters or the LGBT Pride March themselves in unofficial capacities, but the police know they're there, so they're even more pressured to uh, protect the marchers. And here's another image of the National Motherland Monument edited um, for visual circulation by a drone carrying the flag. This was from the 2020 March, which didn't take place in person because of the pandemic. And this um, photo went viral and became a meme for Ukraine because this Soviet era monument, which is exactly nine meters taller than the Stat Statue of Liberty and faces New York, is the kind of super ego <laughs> the Soviet one of the women's suffragists in the, in the US. Um, right now, the director of this museum, this is the, underneath her is the World War II Museum. Uh, there are 40,000 artifacts from World War II kept there. And the director, Yuri Savchuk, is a Fulbright alum. Uh, we communicate often. He's working on reimagining the narrative around this monument. And he's also um, interested in working with contemporary artists inside of his museum to rework the Soviet ideology that is, is represented both in the artifacts themselves, but in their display, which was last, I think, curated in 1970 in their permanent collection. But what is also relevant here for artists in the last um, 10 years, especially since the war started in Lysychansk, Luhansk, uh, and Donetsk, is the monument, the monument itself. Um, Ukrainian artists have, I'm gonna go forward here through the March photos. You can see some of the artifacts from my participation in the March here. Lesya Ukrainka, the national poet, is from the 19th century, who is rumored to be also um, a lesbian in a relationship with Olha Kobylianska from the 19th century, another poet. Um, she's here and she features very widely as a symbol of Ukrainian uh, feminism and, and Ukrainian movements for women's rights. But I want to show you the monuments. So today monuments are covered with sandbags to protect them from, from missile strikes. But not all of the monuments are deemed valuable. Um, some Soviet era monuments have been destroyed arbitrarily um, since the revolution. The decommunization laws, a set of four laws were introduced by uh, then President Poroshenko and largely governed what one could publish or keep in public space that represented the Soviet past. These laws, two out of four of them, became very controversial among Ukrainians and, and, and among artists who decided to contest them regularly in their work by largely engaging with Soviet monuments in public space, editing them, um, collecting them and putting them into different contexts, um, talking about their own parents and grandparents, uh, very complex relations with the regime in the 90s uh, at, at the fall of the Soviet Union as well. And I'm gonna show you more of these, but this wall here also, um, I think encapsulates as in a, a very good case study, the complex nature of decommunization of public space, what that means, who decides what is communist and what is not communist. Um, in general, almost unanimously, Ukrainians, even on the left, will agree communism is not something they want to return to, that the Soviet past and the um, glorification of it is the work of Putin in the Kremlin and the propaganda is often used to exploit the identifications of, of families and individuals to make them feel ashamed for being uh, Soviet in, the, in their families or in the past. And that's a very unfair thing to do to, to Ukrainians. And a lot of the artists have, in the last um, 10 years, as I mentioned during the war, 
been very aware of this vulnerability in Ukrainian culture as um, a tool of exploitation by the colonial power, by, by Russia, by Putin. And so they have very deliberately um, contested the decommunization laws, arguing they, they have introduced a censorship law that makes it easier to censor Ukrainians who actually want to speak as Ukrainians and, and are very proud of their um, very plural ideas, not only ethnically Ukrainian, but also Crimean Tatar, or maybe have some Turkish family or Polish or Jewish, and some are Russophone, some, some of the artists uh, speak in Russian because they don't want to be um, used as tools of nation making during the revolution. They want it to still be their revolution. So this wall, anyway, is the marker of Soviet space all public institutions in the Soviet era had to be painted this way. So in the halls of schools or hospitals, or even apartment complexes in the corridors, you will still see this blue and white wall. And the um, exhibition called Ukrainian Body um, included a piece called Feminist Workshop in which Vova Vorodnyov, a graffiti artist, collaborated with a photographer who I have a, a very extensive chapter in my book about, Yevgenia Belarus. It's in a space of one's own. Also, they've, they revisited this exhibit from 2012 in 2019 in a larger exhibit in Kyiv named after Virginia Woolf. Uh, they are, they're really working with this wall um, by using different uh, or alternative non-binary just non-binary non gender identifications in self-portraits in front of the wall. So here we have uh, artist and feminist and also curator and good friend of mine, Oksana Brukovetska, wearing a dress, carrying a bottle of wine, um, identifying herself as, as a woman. Um, and Anatoly Bielov, who is also an artist and has done quite a lot for opening up queer art in, in Ukraine. Um, he's very well known as, as a uh, painter and sketch artist. He wears a dress and happens to be wearing a Superman t-shirt, I don't know why. Um, but this is, this is also featured this wall in, let's see, several other, works. Here you can see it in the background of a textiles factory. Um, I mentioned textiles factories in New York earlier. Um, it's not a coincidence. A lot of the people working in those factories came from Eastern Europe where they were, you know, exporting textiles and still export textiles. And in Ukraine, you have um, a lot of exploited labor in, in the textiles labor and supply and demand chain. This has been documented by the photographer Yevgenia Belarus. It's here you see this blue wall again, and she was the same photographer who, who did the exhibit with Vova Vorotnyov I just showed you with the blue wall. This is also hers from 2012. So it carries through and also has reached film. This was the Academy Award nominated film, The Tribe, Plemya, by Miroslav Slebosh Petitsky, and he's doing something similar here as Yevgenia in front of the blue wall showing an act of abortion, completely taboo in many, many countries and many spaces. And also, again, very tied in with um, issues important to women that are always on the platform of debates in feminism in Ukraine today. As a footnote, abortion remains legal in Ukraine um, it's not in Poland. A lot of nearby women go to Ukraine um, for, have been going there for abortions for many decades. It's a huge area of discussion. I won't get into it here, but there is a lot of good writing on it right now available. In the March 8 Women's March in Kyiv in 2018, another figure of abortion also entered the march and became um, iconic for that year's women's um, debates after the march. This is a figure of a woman, but also you can see the clothes hanger, 
the kind of international symbol of, of uh, abortion that is dangerous and violent and, and harmful to, to women because it can be, it's performed outside of um, medical institution. And the national symbol of Ukraine, the trident on the left, which is a neutral national symbol. It's, it does not have identifications with any um, side of the political spectrum and a cross. So this poster was created uh, by uh, an artist who has done works in many different contexts, including for UN campaigns for women. And it was taken to court by the opposition who was at the march um, on the basis that it was an infraction of the protest code, what one can legally, legally do at a protest in Ukraine. And the reason was because it included the national symbol, the trident, not any reference to nudity or abortion, which was a bogus charge. But the court took the poster, arrested the poster in a kind of neo-Soviet act where in the Soviet era, you could arrest a journal for not comp being compliant with official culture. And that's what happened to this poster at the Women's March. It was arrested, but it was acquitted. So this was an important moment and a relatively recent one that is very illustrative of how art actually does impact legislation. Because after this part, after this march, um, a newer space opened in protest where you could get away with a little bit more and be more expressive and self-determining in your discussions and certainly could discuss abortion because had this poster been um, taken to, to jail <laughs> and sentenced, maybe the outcome would be different. The next year's poster by the same artist in 2019 was very clearly anti-war, showing birth and death in a cycle around a mother's nude body. Um, the style of the aesthetic of this painting is very connected um, to early folk art and woodcut etchings in Ukraine. The face, the way it looks is, is um, somewhat androgynous actually. And I think that this poster, like the work I showed before, um, in also having you know a nude woman, it it really does reintroduce a much older and powerful aesthetic of a goddess figure in Ukraine, of the Berehinya, the mother of the nation. The Berehinya is what the Soviet statue actually appropriates in this um, first image that I showed you of of the motherland statue. So. This appropriation of the Soviet past and the reworking of it is, is a quite powerful aesthetic experiment that has been ongoing. And um, during the earlier periods of the war, many artists were, were making um, trips to Lysychansk right on the front line. And that's where this Soviet, Soviet monument to World War II Red Army soldiers is based. Um, I took this photo. I went with a group of about 10 artists and curators to Lysychansk um, in 2019. The war was happening about 20 kilometers away. And you could see around the town the same uh, empty Lenin statues. This is the empty plinth. As in the rest of Ukraine, during the Lenin fall of 2014, all of the statues were removed. And a lot of artists, again, as I showed you the blue wall, they have used these plinths as a trope in their work. And, and if you, somebody could write a whole book and, and maybe should about the Lenin plinths because in Ukraine, they, they really have become a grammar for post-revolution and, and getting away from the Soviet past, but not doing so by simply erasing the present and allowing a kind of false blank slate, which is very vulnerable and, actually just recycles the acts that the Soviets were doing of erasure and blank slate. So this is a, is a canvas. And here are some locals just having a beer on a summer day. It was a, a lovely town. Um, many people 
just living their lives as though the war was not taking place right next door. And that's largely how life in Ukraine has had to proceed for the past 10 years um, for some psychosocial sanity to remain in place. Everyday life and small joys like beer on a summer day still have to, have to take place. And again, here's another example of um, how an artist has used one of the tropes, the blue wall, and here the, the Lenin's plinth, Vlada Ralko's very well-known contemporary artist in Ukraine. I encourage you to, to check out her work. Um, she made this Kievsky Shodenik in 2013 about um, her experience on Maidan. And what's interesting in this Kievsky Shodenik, which means Kiev journal, there are about 150 watercolor paintings and sketches there, and they blend war and revolution as was the case in World War I. And this was a very early moment in which she was creating um, this journal and the images that she used, a lot of them, a lot of them were also um, very informed by her time she spends on the Dnipro River in the birthplace of Taras Shevchenko, who is the national poet of Ukraine um, from the late 19th century. He was essentially com a contemporary of Pushkin in Russia. They, they knew of each other and communicated once in a while, but they were not, not friends necessarily. Shevchenko himself, um, being a writer, he was also an artist, actually was an artist first. He was a serf and he was um, bought out of slavery and given his freedom based on the quality of his drawings. And then he became a writer because he became literate after being emancipated in the, in the great emancipation of serfdom in um, 1863. So for Ukraine, um, to have a national poet who was a serf in the Russian Empire is also quite um, telling of, of today's struggle for, cons constant struggle for emancipation and self-identification and sovereignty. And here I have also once again uh, another trope for the generation today engaging with the Soviet past and moving beyond the, that older language of revolution which became actually colonial and now ushering in a new revolution um, of dignity. And here there is a collection of Soviet uh, neoclassical sculptures from the region of Lysychansk, Luhansk, and these are um, activists from Izolatsia Cultural Platform, which is based in Kyiv now, but used to be based in Donetsk. They relocated in 2014. Their old site in Donetsk has been turned into a prison. It was turned into a prison very early on, and the Russian occupiers, then called separatists, uh, destroyed the the artworks they found there by shooting them. And the cultural platform in Kyiv keeps a record of, of this. Um, that is very powerful, I think, evidence to the, the types of targetings of, and destruction of culture, um, which is a war crime, that, that have been ongoing since 2014. And you can see a lot of the sculptures here actually from the Soviet era were made by Ukrainian artists who suffered under the regime. And, and not only um, those who suffered or pushed the line of official culture in ways that, that were dangerous for them, but also contributed to global aesthetics. Um, I'm also thinking of the filmmaker uh, Dovzhenko, who's, who was very much an official artist, but his, his films have been so, you know, uh, I think groundbreaking in the editing and the mass scale. So there, there's not a total erasure just because something was created in the Soviet era. And this is why artists feel, I think, in Ukraine um, and curators, and I speak as someone who works also as a curator, not only a scholar, um, that saving these artworks is 
also really valuable and not always should be left to the officers or the military on either side to determine what's valuable. You know, taste and aesthetics are so um, subjective in, in, in how to measure. So to give all of that power to the state only to make official choices on what can be kept and what can, should be destroyed um, is happening and it's happening in a rapid pace during a war. So there have been more efforts like by the museum director of World War II Museum to work with other museums in Europe and also U UNESCO and international bodies to make it a global discussion, not one that is um, only internal to Ukraine, but that involves um, experts who can help determine what to do with these with these you know, pieces of cultural heritage and make the story meaningful and relevant for the revolution today, which so many are saying now, I think more than before, it's a global one. Here we have um, you know, anti-tank uh, weapon from the Soviet era and the curators in this local museum um, put folk paintings from early Ukrainian, Western Ukrainian uh, depictions of nature and the Cossacks. And here, you know, it's just, it's, I think, a very profound artifact because it illustrates, you know, the prior revolution and the, and the also World War II experience of the Red Army that many Ukrainians also still are conflicted about because some of their, many of their grandparents were part of the Red Army or um, they lost members of their families to that war. So it's, a, I think, a very sort of um, ambiguous and powerful display. It's also anti-war to put art on a, on a defensive weapon or a weapon. It, it can open up a, a Pandora's box of close readings and instead of doing all those close readings myself, in my, in my daily work, um, I, I have a great privilege of being proximate to many artists and curators in Ukraine and communicating with them and, and also scholars um, every day. And so I created an exhibit earlier this year, which is in Michigan right now at University of Michigan, that features about 10 women's women artists from Ukraine writing or speaking or painting about the war. Um, I can only hope that exhibits like this will grow and more artists will receive um, opportunities to engage. And I also look forward to being part of engaging this community here in future in whatever <laughs> capacities I can. But I know I'm running short on time, um, so I will just show you a few last slides um, because these are great artifacts. This is by Mikola Ridney, a filmmaker whose grandfather was in the anarchist army in 1918-1920 in uh, the territories of Kiev and Kharkiv. And that's also very interesting because I invited him to speak in one of my courses I was teaching in Kiev to my students. And he spoke about this film which, and also Gray Horses, which is largely about his grandfather. And the students were fascinated. They were asking lots of questions. Um, but one question that kept, kept coming up was how women were treated even within the anarchist army in Ukraine and within the left, um, because there were lots of cases of rape in that context of war, not a big surprise. Um, but the same thing is happening today. And I think for the students, this was, this was just a very powerful and rare opportunity for them to, to discuss the, the topic. And I was going to share with you some just last images of eyes and seeing and vision and how all of these, these are also Vlada Ralko's images you can see here. Um, these are Taras Shevchenko, his uh, drawings. Remember, he's the national poet from the 19th century who informs Vlada Ralko's work quite a bit. Here you can see her work again. I will just end on this image from Taras Shevchenko. Um, 
he has a lot of figures in his sketches that are floating. M one could say <laughs> some kind of um, you know, influence maybe filtered down to Marc Chagall and others. Marc Chagall was from Vitebsk, Belarus, um, but it was also about resources because paper was scarce and he wanted to practice his drawing and so he drew in every space on the paper and scarcity of paper may be the future revolution. So um, the future driver of, of revolution. So that's why I end on this image. But I wanted to just save um, 10 minutes or so for questions and I plan to also be here for the next couple of days so we can chat further as well. And also my email address is openly available. So I look forward to hearing from all of you. That was fantastic, Jessica. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that and for sharing such a fascinating presentation. I think you've done a really, <clears throat> really wonderful job of sort of mapping uh, current ideas about self-determination uh, onto the sort of historic context that we're interested in, but also uh, reminding us of this revolutionary context because you know when we're talking about self-determination, we're, we're 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 not always talking about revolution, but there is this sort of revolutionary dimension to to many of the the, the narratives of. Uh, of self-determination in the 20th century. Um, I think the other thing that you've, you've done very helpfully here is complicate some of our ideas, some of the ideas we might have about what self-determination looks like. In an, Irish, in an Irish context, it might look like one thing in terms of officialdom, in terms of sort of uh, 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 representations of the native and so on. Um, but that, 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 that our map of this, this idea doesn't necessarily correlate with, with other national contexts. So I think that kind mm -hmm. of complexity is really important as we think through the, the next couple of days. Um, I could talk to you, I mean, I have tons of questions I could ask, but I'm, I'm conscious of time and I, I do want to, to open the floor to questions. So if, if anybody does have a question, I mean, now, now is the moment, thanks. <clears throat> Um, sorry, quick question. Yeah, I was just fascinated by the term because I hadn't heard it before of uh, decommunizing, <laughs> um, which is like obvious in a way, you know, when you hear it. Um, so I'd love, would you mind talking about that a bit? Because I thought it was such an interesting idea in relation to this idea of legacies and erasure, um, essentialism and um, pan-universalism, you know, like what, what communism could and, and doesn't mean in this context. So if you wouldn't mind elaborating on it, that would be great. Sure. So, in the official definition, the decommunization laws that were entered into parliament in Ukraine and passed in 2014, 2015, um, had four parts. And one was um, th the inability to criticize any hero from World War II including the Ukrainian partisan army heroes, and that includes a very divisive figure, Stepan Bandera, um, who is uh, also divisive for the diaspora, for Ukrainians living abroad. Um, and then the other parts of the law included um, the inability or the removal of monuments or changing of public space. And then the other two were about transparency to archives, access to information, um, and also regulation and transparency in institutions. And those were not controversial. But the, the out, <clears throat> actually the outlawing of any hero during World War II um, is also a point of de debate that um, at the same time was entering into Polish politics because a similar law was put on the table there and it did not pass um, because the letters of um, open letters against it from scholars around the world were effective and also Yad Vashem in Israel was effective there because the um, inability to, to criticize heroes includes those who did collaborate during World War II and Stepan Mandara and the partisan army is largely known actually for, for working with Nazi occupiers in Western Ukraine, but it's a very 
uh, thorny path that Ukraine is, is still just embarking on and will have to deal with, especially in uh, memorial sites like the Babinyar um, site of, it's a mass grave just north of Kyiv where uh, many, not only Jews, but also Roma and others were destroyed. And a lot of Ukrainians um, were not happy with those ideas of decommunization because they were passed unilaterally without any vote by the post-revolution government led by Poroshenko. And since that time um, have, have become, I think, since the war certainly, have become recognized maybe as part of a vulnerability that Putin can exploit more easily because to, who determines who's a hero, who's not a hero? If you're just not even opening the door to public debate, you, you allow even more vulnerability. So in, in decommunization, um, I guess it's, it's really a top-down definition in that sense. That word is, is a very official one and, and not liked so much <laughs> in that That's sense. Tough. Yeah. A question here. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I had a question. I was really interested to see um, a re-engagement with, with art from the pre-Stalinist period, uh, and I had a question about how intellectuals and artists in contemporary Ukraine engage with that period prior to Stalin um, of Bolshevik rule, and and how they grapple with the kind of balancing, you know, some of these anti, anti-Soviet anti or anti-Russian um, um, sentiments, particularly connected to the current invasion, with the kind of cultural promise and political promise that that early project represented, at least in theory, um, for Ukrainian minority groups or for women in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Um Recently, in the last five years, there have been some key exhibits, particular to th this group um, that I showed you with Oksana Pavlenko. They are known as the Boychukisti, named after Boychuk, the, the main leader of that group. And these have been very supported by the state and by others, but it, it took a lot to get to that point. And I think now there has been more kind of widespread um, acceptance in, in Ukraine's Ministry of Culture and also Foreign Ministry, which created Ukrainian Institute, which is their cultural diplomacy arm, um, because there's been foreign demand for understanding the early avant-garde. And why has there been foreign demand? Because the avant-garde, like modernism, proclaimed itself to be universal and was spreading ideas all around the world and artifacts and visits. Um, so the, the ideas are already abroad and now that there's renewed interest in Ukraine, people want to know about that connection. So there has been an opening up that, that I think has been largely propelled by globalism and the globalization of Ukraine's early avant-garde. And that being said, I think one of the key differences to um, that makes Ukraine a really fascinating place to study and why I love it and keep going back there all the time and, and have lived my life there really is because modernism there began in this way that um, I think was ahead uh, and earlier than modernism's elsewhere because there was this, you know, the Bolshevik idea became a kind of um, aesthetic prototype for, for modernism and a violent one in many senses and also failed, but some of those failures I think can, can be productive um, mistakes, so. Fantastic. That's, that's I mean, there's that, there's that maps so clearly onto what we're talking about in terms of the, the exploration of self-determination through this, this project at IMA. And I would really love to talk more about it. I, I, I do realise we're, we're, we're sort of out of time now. Sure. Um, and I want to be sure we, we, we give everybody time to, to have a coffee. We'll be, we'll be back here um, at 11 o'clock for the next panel. But could everybody just join me in, in thanking Jessica for a really fantastic presentation. <laughs>